In November 1946, squadron leader Bernard Fitzgerald Collins was appointed as manager of Southend Municipal Airport. He was given the enormous task of developing it into an airport with international potential, despite having a very limited budget and a shortage of materials. The airport's license was issued on 31 December, and the airport was officially opened for commercial air traffic on 1 January 1947. The first airline to be established was East Anglian Flying Services, which later changed its name to Channel Airways. It was founded by squadron leader Jack Jones AFC, initially operating with just a single de Havilland DH-80A Pusmoff, offering pleasure flights along the seafront, banner towing, and aerial photography. In 1949, Aviation Traders Engineering Limited set up an aircraft maintenance base at Southend, which was primarily used for the Handley Page Halifax and Holton aircraft employed in the Berlin airlift operations. The first night landing at Southend was made on 16 May, 1949 by a cruise air Douglas DC-3 on a cargo flight from Hamburg, and portable flares were used to illuminate the runway. Bernard Collins noted the use of ground-controlled approach radar during the Berlin airlift operations, and how it contributed to the success by allowing aircraft to operate in all but the worst weather conditions at the Tempelhof, Gatto, and Tegel airfields in Berlin. It proved to him how talk-down radar was an invaluable aid to airports, and realized that if Southend was going to be able to offer the same tall weather capability, this equipment would be needed. But it was prohibitively expensive, estimated to be around £50,000, and only the military and the larger international airports could afford it. He was daunted, but not deterred by this, and arranged a meeting with Eric Cole of the Echo Company in Southend, to discuss the issue of ground-controlled approach talk-down radar and the high costs involved, and to ask if something cheaper but was just as good could be produced. Following the meeting, Eric Cole tasked his chief engineer Tony Martin to look into the feasibility of designing such a system. Tony Martin was fully aware that all of the existing GCA systems had been designed and built with little regard for its cost, and that radar had grown up during wartime when the military had unlimited money to lavish on it, and each improvement had been achieved by adding complications, which meant that radar had long since passed the primitive stages of its evolution. Martin sat down with his team of engineers, led by Ted O'Flynn, who was a wartime radar engineer and ran a special projects laboratory at South End, and started to backtrack trying to design a simple radar system that might have been developed in the early days if military money had not been so plentiful. The system wouldn't be able to have the spinning surveillance antenna that provided the radar eye view of the air around the airport that conventional ground control approach radar had, so through subsequent meetings, Collins set out the requirements to Martin and O'Flynn, and engineers John Price, Mike Fogarty and Bernard Walker, that the air traffic controller should simply be able to positively acquire and identify an aircraft at a minimum of 10 miles away, and have the means to be able to accurately talk it down on a 3-degree glide path, to an obstacle clearance limit height of 250 feet at half a mile from touchdown. The task was made easier by the fact that at the Echo factory at Malmesbury, work was already in progress on a radar ranging system for the Royal Air Force Hawker Hunter. The ARI-5820 was an almost perfect match in terms of radar performance, and the X-band radar employed could meet the range requirements and had a high pulse repetition frequency which could provide the high resolution image required to bring a target down a glide path when mated to the 5-inch high visibility CRT, which was developed for the ASV Mark 19 for the Ferry Gannet. The changes required to reduce the beam width to 3 degrees was overcome by increasing the diameter of the antenna dish to 36 inches, which also provided extra range, and changing both the range marker generator and the video output to show the required CRT indicator markers on the ranges of 0 to 16 nautical miles at every 2 miles and 0 to 4 at every half mile on the A-scope. 
many discussions took place between Bernard Collins and the controllers over the development of the hardware to suit their needs in a control tower environment, and the finished design was a structure which has been likened to a periscope in a submarine, where the operator stood at a console of about three feet square, the front of which had a five-inch diameter A-scope with an illuminated compass above it, together with a series of lights. These showed the controller if the aircraft was either on track or to the left or the right. Behind the front panel was the equipment rack containing the transmitter receiver and the waveguide assembly. The whole of the console was mounted on a pole-like structure, which was fixed to the floor via a bearing housing, and the top projected through the roof of the control tower, above which was a small gearbox and the antenna dish. This pole also held the waveguide feed to the antenna and two flexible Bowden cables, which controlled the azimuth tilt of the antenna via what could be described as two motorcycle twist grips attached to a modified motorcycle handlebar this being the means by which the operator could rotate the whole unit through 360 degrees if necessary, so that all runways were covered. By June 1949, the first tests were taking place at the airport using an airport-owned Percival Proctor as the target aircraft. The tests were completed a year later, and the system gained approval and certification by the Civil Aviation Authority in December 1951, allowing it to be used operationally, and it was demonstrated to the press in January 1952. At South End Airport, a new angle on civic cooperation is illustrated as Alderman Clark, Mayor of South End, welcomes the Lord Mayor of Coventry and members of the city's airport committee who arrived to study traffic handling on Britain's second busiest airport. ECHO's public relations officer discusses with pilot Meredith plans for the party's survey of ECHO equipment in use here. The two mayors, with committee chairman Councillor Berry, decide on an airborne survey, while others view the control tower. And ECHO's chief engineer outlines to Mr. Batho, Coventry's airport manager, the operation of the weather radar and ground mapping equipment to be demonstrated during flight. This is similar to that which ECHO supplies to BOAC's Britannias and Comet 4s. takes off, other members of Coventry's airport committee view first the ECHO automatic direction finder. Chief Traffic Controller Cusworth explains operation of this device which instantly translates the briefest aircraft radio signal into a clear and accurate bearing up to a range of 100 miles. Bearings appear as radial lines on the, on the face of a cathode ray tube which is surrounded by a 360 degree scale. By the turn of a switch, the traffic controller can obtain the reciprocal magnetic bearing for the pilot's information as a further step to rapid traffic handling. The chief controller also explains that the heart of the system is the rotating direction finding aerial which can be sighted up to two miles distant from the control tower. On the tower itself is the familiar swinging radar dish which is part of ECHO's airfield approach aid. This enables the control staff to talk down any type of aircraft on any desired approach pattern. Figuratively speaking, the operator handles a radar telescope which he rotates or elevates by means of twist grip handles to follow the aircraft on the screen which gives direction, elevation and range. Illuminated indicators show when the desired approach path is maintained. Deviation from the course lights up instruction panels, turn right or turn left to correct the error simplifying the controller's task of talking down the plane onto the runway. A demonstration is given in conjunction with the airborne party's aircraft, now visible at six miles on the A-scope long-range scale. The radar echo moves slowly from six to four miles as the plane makes the base leg of the approach. Now heading for the final approach, the aircraft is seen on the short range scale, a mile and a half distant, and is stalked steadily down the flight path to the runway. Yeah. 
With the return of the airborne group, the remainder of the party prepared to board the aircraft. Mr. Brunker and Mr. Batho resumed discussion, and the two mayors expressed their thanks to Southend's airport manager. ECHO, in turn, expresses keen appreciation of this example of civic and industrial cooperation fostered so warmly by Southend's loyal mayor and Coventry's enterprising Lord Mayor, Alderman K. H. Winslow. A GCA unit designed for small mobile airfields was mounted in a MONAB, a mobile naval air base. It had a rotating adcock aerial, and a PPI display with suppressed brilliance had been fitted above the A-scope, so that an aircraft calling on the approach frequency would appear as an illuminated line on the screen in the direction of the transmission. This could be switched from QTE to QDM to give the operator the exact bearing for him to then rotate the aerial for its location, and the precise direction for the aircraft to fly to the base. Despite the system meeting the requirement set out in the original plan, it did not have the height finding and reporting of the mainstream systems, but it was an interesting project for ECHO, and proved to be a very long-lasting and reliable system, probably because of its simplicity, and remained in use at South End until around 1982.